Well, hello, my name is Gordon Palmer. Welcome to our service at Clement Parish Church. It's our service for Sunday the 9th of May. As well as myself taking part in the service, it'll be Stephen Preston, who is bringing God's Word to us, uh, Leslie Gold leading us in the prayers for others, and Alison Ross is doing the signing. Listen for the Word of God. The psalmist writes, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim His name, make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Indeed, let us rejoice, let us give praise and adoration to such a God. Our hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. pray and uh, we'll gather up the prayers and the words of the Lord's Prayer. The words that we use for the Lord's Prayer will appear on the screen. Let us pray. Lord, we come to bring you praise, you the Almighty, you the Lord, the King of creation, you too the Lord, the King of our salvation. We come to you as seekers of your word, searchers for your truth. We come to you as people in need of direction. And Lord, you have revealed yourself. You have spoken. You guide. And so we're ready to listen, to hear, to follow. We thank you that we can be safe in the knowledge of who you are. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God of love. Father, Son, and Spirit, a God who has spoken, who has revealed yourself, a God who has promised. And we can trust your promises. We can be certain, too, that you are a God of faithfulness, 
You don't get distracted. You don't get fed up and go away. But you have committed yourself to being with us, with your people. You have committed yourself to fulfilling your purposes, to bringing us to the new heavens and the new earth. And Lord, we admit before you that in many times we've got it wrong. In many times we have failed to understand the way that you've called us to live. Many times we have left the Scriptures unopened or unheeded. And we even have to admit that there have been times when we have tried to twist and turn to find ways of dodging your call, ignoring its challenge. Lord God, we praise you that with you there is forgiveness and a new beginning. We put our trust in your grace and love and compassion. So, Lord, through Christ who died and rose for us, assure us through the presence of your Holy Spirit now of our forgiveness, of pardon, and of peace restored with you. And, Lord, help us again to hear your word of forgiveness spoken clearly now into our hearts and minds. And help us, Lord, to hear the Word of God as you come to us in the Scriptures. And Lord, may our lives be shaped by your Word, that we might be more faithful in our following of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, and in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from time and trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Last week, we began a series looking at the tests that there are for faith from the book of James. And this morning, we continue in that. We're going to read from chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after or orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Amen. Today we come to our second study in our focus group series, Faith Tested and Tried. We're studying the book of James in this series, and today we're looking at James 1, 19 to 27, and in particular, 
how we respond to Scripture. I wonder what your instinctive reaction is when you hear this week's study topic, faith tested our response to Scripture. This will be a bundle of laughs. I give you my promise it won't be. I've had more than enough testing in the past year, thanks very much, so give me a break, leave me alone. My biblical knowledge is pretty good, so I'm reasonably relaxed that my faith is in pretty good shape, although a wee bit of tidying up on the edges wouldn't go amiss. Where do I start? My life's a car crash. My faith's pitiful. I'm really struggling. I'm failing with flying colors. In the very first chapter of the Bible, chapter 1 of Genesis, we read, God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. In James chapter 1, 17 to 18, immediately before today's passage, we read, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits to all he created, of all he created. In the beginning, it was very good. We were made in God's image. The Garden of Eden was paradise. God hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't decided that giving his life was a bad idea after all. However, we are created in God's image. God is not a robot. And so, as human beings created in his image, neither are we. We have free will, which we can use wisely or otherwise. The first inhabitants of Eden, Adam and Eve, chose unwisely and disobeyed God, clearly thinking their plans for the garden might trump anything God could come up with. Their life goals and ambitions were going to be just that, their goals, their plans, and they were going to take center stage, take control, and God was going to be consigned to the wings with a bit part in their lives, or worse, outside in the street, knocking on the stage door, trying to get in. Humanity, bereft of humility, the humility that receives God, that puts God at the center of our lives, has been trying to regain the paradise of Eden ever since. And one thing is clear. We can never regain Eden. We can never fix the mess ourselves. That's way beyond our pay grade and skill set. Fast forward to another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus, the perfect image of God, Emmanuel, God with us, in total obedience, under immense pressure, Praise to his Father, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. In contrast to Adam and Eve's disobedience and failure to trust God and his goodness, Jesus obeys his Father, despite the fact that meant going through horrific suffering on the cross at Calvary. 
I suspect we struggle to fully understand why it was necessary for Jesus to suffer and die. In Isaiah 53:10, we read, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Cecil Francis Alexander wrote, There is a green hill far away outside a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. We may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven saved by his precious blood. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Oh, dearly, dearly has he loved and we must love him too and trust in his redeeming blood and try his works to do. In his book, God and Mute, Pete Gregg writes, in his darkest hour, Jesus addresses himself to Abba Father. The power of prayer depends almost entirely upon our apprehension of who it is with whom we speak. When we are scared and hurting, when life feels chaotic and out of control, it's more important than ever to anchor ourselves in the absolute and eternal truth that we are dearly loved and deeply held by the most powerful being in the universe. Let this be the great non-negotiable in our lives, the platform for all our thoughts and the plumb line for our prayers. Eugene Peterson, in his introduction to the book of James in the message, writes, according to church traditions, James carried the nickname Old Camel Knees because of thick calluses built up on his knees from many years of determined prayer. The prayer is foundational to the wisdom. Prayer is always foundational to wisdom. James is therefore passionate about sharing the Word of God, the truth of who we are in Christ, the Gospel. Everything in our lives which doesn't mirror Jesus needs to go. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil which is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, it's abundantly clear that a wee mini makeover a haircut, a new shirt is not what James is proposing, nor does he suggest that we can mirror God's righteousness by iron self-discipline combined with a Colgate fixed smile for marketing purposes. We can only grow in Christ, grow more like him when we have the humility to recognize our need of him and accept him in our lives. In Isaiah 55, 10 to 11, we read, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth 
and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So God promises to be at work in our lives, recreating us in his image when we let him, when we receive him, when we let him in. In the message, James 1 to 21 reads, Throw all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple humility, let our gardener God landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. In simple humility, let our gardener God landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. The early church, as we do today, needed to hear this message and live their lives in the light of hearing it. Tom Wright asks, how does this happen? Every generation in the church worries rightly about people who just glide along, seeming to enjoy what they hear in church, but without, making, without it making any real difference. Nominal Christians, we sometimes say. It's comforting in a way to know that James faced exactly the same problem in the very first generation. People who were happy to listen to the Word, this presumably means both the teaching of the Old Testament and the message about Jesus, but who went away without it having affected them very much. This, of course, should come as no surprise to anyone, as Jesus warned us that for some folks this would be the case. Tragically, perhaps for most folks whose connection with Jesus might be fleeting or shallow. In the parable of the sower in Mark 4, 1 to 20, Jesus outlines the different responses people have to hearing the Word of God. And in verses 14 to 20, he explains the parable to his disciples, who, as was often the case, like you and me, were struggling to understand what Jesus was getting at. Jesus says, the farmer, God, sows the word. Some people are like seed along a path where the word is sown in them. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. There it is. Some people hear the word, accept or receive or believe the word, take God at his word, and then produce a crop. They act on what they've heard. 
they do something about it. You will not hear from these folks. That was a nice sermon. Now off to lunch. Their lives are changed and changing. Their lives count for something. Their lives become productive. Their lives have a newfound purpose and meaning and point and worth, even although all difficulties and difficult circumstances will not miraculously disappear. Indeed, at times the opposite will be the case. Nevertheless, having tasted and seen that the Lord is good, so they become more and more focused on sharing God's goodness with everyone else. And any notion of being a nominal Christian goes out the window as they partner God the gardener as he builds his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, in James' day, mirrors were pretty thin in the ground and were basically highly polished metal. So a quick glance at that type of mirror isn't going to reflect a particularly clear or memorable image of how you really look. A lot of us during lockdown would have been delighted to have one of those mirrors. Similarly, with some of our responses to Scripture. If your Bible reading plan is little more than the odd glance now and again, you're not likely to remember much. Indeed, there's not much to remember with the soundbite Scripture reading plan. No surprise then if that approach, approach doesn't impact your life much. For those of you who are like me on social media, ask yourselves and be honest, how much time do I spend on social media compared to how much time I spend reading the Bible or prayer or chewing over, thinking about what you've read and what God may be teaching you or trying to teach you? Is Scripture or social media a bigger influence on your life? The two, of course, are not mutually exclusive. It's important, too, not simply to regard the amount of time you spend reading the Bible as the most important thing, but rather how you read the Bible. I'm going to quote from Alex Motyer's commentary on James. It's quite long, so bear with me. It's possible to be unfailingly regular in Bible reading, but to achieve no more than to have moved the bookmark forward. This is reading unrelated to an attentive spirit. The word is read but not heard. On the other hand, if we can develop an attentive spirit, this will spur us to create those conditions, a proper method in Bible reading, a discipline of time, and so on, by which the spirit will find itself satisfied in hearing the Word of God. It is only part of our fruitful use of the Word of God to hear it and receive it, but it is a part on which we might unduly preen ourselves. I spent 50 minutes this morning reading the Bible, and I can remember what I read. It was a super uninterrupted time. And James would say, well done. But now, what about obeying the word you read? Have you actually changed your mind so that you now hold to be true what you learned in the word? Have you and are you redirecting your imagination and your eyes and your thoughts so as to live according to the standards of the word? 
Are your relationships different as the Word instructed you they should be? And so he could go on. We must be doers of the Word. Where the man with the mirror goes away, verse 24, the believer with the Bible perseveres, verse 25, more literally continues in its company. This can happen any day and every day. There can be a continuing enjoyment of a relationship with God's truth and God's law begun in the early morning, but it is a work of a lifetime. It is like the deep and pervasive matching of lives, personalities, and thoughts which emerges in the course of a happy marriage. Greta Thunberg, the environmental campaigner, was featured in a recent TV documentary. She believes the only thing that creates hope in relation to reversing global warming is action. She says, we can sit and do nothing, and that may feel very hopeless. But as soon as we start taking action, there is hope. So that's the mentality I'm trying to live off. And just imagine if we started to actually take action. I mean, we don't know what that could lead to. We don't know what social tipping points we could pass. Now think of Jesus' call to his disciples, to you and me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I have commanded you. And surely... I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is a call to action if ever there was one. This is active discipleship, committed discipleship. What other kind is there? It's also not a pious platitude or a sanctimonious suggestion which won't make any difference to anything or anyone. I'm going to finish by reading James 1, 19 to 27 from the message, because sometimes it helps to hear another translation. Post this at all the intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears. Follow up with your tongue. And let your anger straggle along in the rear. God's righteousness doesn't grow from human anger. So throw all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple humility, let our gardener God landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. Don't fool yourself into thinking you're a listener when you're anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are, what they look like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye, and sticks with it, is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in action. Anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air, and only hot air. Real religion the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and the loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. I'm going to use a prayer from Pete Gregg's prayer course based on his book, God and Mute. 
This is a prayer of relinquishment written by Richard Foster. And I invite you today to own this prayer for yourself. Today, O Lord, I yield myself to you. May your will be my delight today. May you have perfect sway in me. May your love be the pattern of my living. I surrender to you my hopes, my dreams, my ambitions. Do with them what you will, when you will, as you will. I place into your loving care my family, my friends, my future. Care for them with a care that I can never give. I release into your hands my need to control, my craving for status, my fear of obscurity. Eradicate the evil, purify the good, and establish your kingdom on earth for Jesus' sake. Amen. In a moment, we'll confess our faith, and Leslie Gold will lead us in our prayers for others. For now, let's sing, We have heard a joyful sound, Jesus saves. <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious fire, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. And on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you aware of your love and goodness, turning our weakness to courage and unbelief to faith. For this we praise you. We know the resurrection power of your love in our lives, but can't help ourselves living in confusion, suspicion and disbelief. Forgive us when our faith is short of understanding, though the truth is there to see. While we live through a global pandemic, help us to do what we can for all who suffer in many different ways. We are thankful for the vaccination programme in the UK and for the NHS staff and volunteers who work so hard to deliver it to all of us. We think of the people in many other countries living in desperate situations. We pray that the governments of these nations would find ways to alleviate the misery of their people. We pray that vaccines may be shared freely by all nations so that lives can be saved and the world will open up once more in relative safety. At the start of Christian Aid Week, we ask that people will give generously to enable the continuation of their work, remembering that all charities are finding difficulty in carrying on because of financial constraints and the difficulty in carrying out their humanitarian services to a needy world. We pray for those living through conflict in places like Syria, Yemen and Myanmar and for the many countries facing famine. God of grace, we bring before you all who are grieving at this time and all who require your healing hand, either physically or mentally. Empower us by the Spirit to bring your word of life as a light to those in darkness, to bring your word of peace to those enslaved by fear, and to bring your word of love to those in need of comfort. God of love, let your name be known through our lives and by your power. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi, now just before we sing our closing hymn, I want to mention again the Thy Kingdom Come um, that we are taking part in this year. It's, it's a worldwide and, and many churches, denominations in, involved in this, that between the um, time of the Ascension Day, when we remember Jesus uh, returning to the Father in heaven, and between that and Pentecost, the gift of the Spirit arriving in the church, we, we focus on, on prayer, particularly prayer for those who do not, know yet, do not yet know Christ. We've just been singing earlier on about a joyful sound that Jesus saves. Well, that's right, it's good news, and it is salvation. It is incredibly important. And so for those 10 days this year, um, between May the 13th and May the 23rd, between for those days, we join with many Christians throughout the world, thinking of up to five friends or family members who do not yet know and follow Jesus and, and praying for them. There's helps if you want them in the uh, Claremont Prayer Diary. It, it's focusing on that in those, those days. But so too, we have this uh, journal here, Thy Kingdom Come Prayer Journal. It's a pretty uh, simple um, explanation of what, what's going on and helpful in giving us prayers and, and to reflect. And it's also um, written to not just for help Christians to pray, um, but also to, to speak to those who are not yet Christians. So, um, we have a number of these still, still left. Um, I'm anxious to um, have as many used as possible. I'd love you to get in touch and say you can use one yourself, but also if you have other folks that you could give it to. Just in the last couple of days, I've had somebody ask for three copies, somebody else ask for, for eight copies. Wouldn't it be great if more of us rose to this opportunity of praying folks for, to be admit, join in the kingdom of God? 
this is salvation, this is good news. And just by way of um, hearing some, a story of its importance, we're going to, going to hear um, one of the Thy Kingdom Come um, short videos, um, just enthusing about it. After you've heard that, you will want to get in touch with me, I hope, and say how many of these poor journals I, I can give you. Um, either email me or uh, phone me at the man's 248526, um, and I'll get these to you before um, Thursday the 13th, which is when um, Ascension Day and when Thy Kingdom Come starts. Listen to the story and please think about how you can be part of this effort. And then after we've heard the video, we'll sing our closing praise when we walk with the Lord. Why is it important to pray? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? I wonder what your answers would be. But my answer is firstly, that we see from Jesus in the gospels that he spent time with his father. He went off on many occasions to spend alone time with his father to pray and seek his face. And so I think we are encouraged to do the same. But Jesus also gives us an example of how to pray, the Lord's prayer. But also, I think prayer, it works. I have seen over many years of my own life when I have prayed about different situations, God always has given an answer. Maybe it's not always the answer that I expect or desire, but I know that God's got a plan in every situation and every season of my life. And I have seen that prayer works. So now I just wanna share a quick story because I have seen that prayer has worked in my life over just the last few months. When I was 13, I met my best friend, Jo. She was 12, I was brunette, she was blonde, and we bonded over our love of Taylor Swift. We've been friends ever since and I've gone through the highs and the lows of growing up. And just a few months ago, I felt really, really challenged to pray for her because she wasn't a Christian. So I began fervently to pray every single day that Joe would come to know Jesus. We began to have more and more conversations about who Jesus is and what he did on the cross for everyone. And I began to explain how she could have life and experience it to the full if she just came to know Jesus personally. And then a few weeks passed by and I remember texting her and I said, Joe, if there's one thing that I could pray for you for, what would it be? And this is the text I got back. Grace, yesterday I made a decision, quietly on my own, in my own space, to become a follower of Jesus. Please pray that I find a church where I can find community, family, and grow in my knowledge of who Jesus is and what he's done for me. What a text to get back. But prayer works. So I wanna encourage you today. If you're praying for your friend, keep praying. Keep pressing in to what God has for them. Take the opportunities to share your faith when the opportunities arise. But believe that God in heaven has a plan. The biggest thing that I discovered when I began to pray for my friend was that I began to grow a desire within me to see her know God. So, prayer works. Keep praying for those friends, those family members who don't yet know Jesus. And I'm believing with you, and I have faith with you that they will too, like Joe, encounter the love of God for themselves.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.